This story was specially selected by my supporters on Patreon. Thank you to Abraham Perez for this suggestion. Every month I pick three stories suggested by my patrons and let you vote on the one that I do. If you want the chance for me to make a video idea of your choosing, please head on over to patreon.com slash traplawross and become a supporter. Thanks patrons! Is there a shiny pinball head in hip hop any more iconic than Toe Budden? Sorry, I mean Joe Budden. Joe is beloved by the hip hop culture today for many reasons. He's not afraid to speak his mind loud and proud, no matter how badly thought out some of his opinions are. He's not afraid to stand up to authority and square up with some of the biggest names in the rap game. And hell, I've got respect for anybody that is willing to go bar for bar with Drizzy Drake and live to tell the tale. Go and check that video out if you haven't seen it. But long before Joe Budden was fighting for the honour of old heads all over the hip hopper back in the day when old heads were just baldy heads and Joe's hairline was still fighting for its life, rather than tearing your favourite rapper a new one on his podcast, Joe was tearing up the mic trying to be your favourite rapper. But I can understand if you truly are a young Lil rather than an older OG, you could be forgiven for not even being aware that Joe even was a rapper before he came the short-tempered Charlemagne that we know him as today. But Joe Budden was a rapper, a pretty damn good one at that too. In fact, Joe Budden had been getting it in on the mic as early as 1999, making demo tracks like Cursed, long before his beloved Newports had ravaged his lungs and given him that famous booming deep voice we have all come to know and love. Big lock, cause I couldn't go without Benjamin. Big shot, to keep my enemies from entering. Fuck with cops, help without the badge gunning feminine. Clearly, Joe Budden had the skills to pay the proverbial bills as well as be able to pay for all of the head moisturizer one could possibly desire. And as Joe's tracks begun to circulate in the streets, he slowly begun to attract industry attention. In 2001, Joe Budden teamed up with producer Dub B and begun to put together demos and mixtapes. And from there, Joe's work eventually wound up in the hands of the professional mix master and beloved board game DJ Clue. And Clue championed Joe Budden's music in the early stages, putting Joe's early tracks and freestyles on mixtapes like his own Heavy E Components tape series, and including him on legendary freestyles with some of the best lyricists in the game like Sean Price and with other rappers like Fabulous. And from there, Joe eventually landed in the good books of Breakfast club side dish, DJ Envy, who placed him on his Desert Storm mixtape series. So at a certain point, Joey's grind in the mixtape game would get him the attention of the iconic Def Jam Records and eventually a bona fide record deal. And so with a signed contract with the most prestigious label in the rap game, Joe was surely set for stardom and he would get it. But little did he know, once he got a little taste of that success he had dreamed of, he'd also attract the jealousy of the most dangerous man on the block and in the boardroom, J to the mother flipping Z. After signing with Def Jam, Joe Budden released his first major label debut single called Focus. In fact, you might remember that song a little bit better than you think, because a teaser clip of the song Focus was actually played at the end of the music video for Pump It Up. Ironically, the point of the video where pretty much everybody had lost Focus. Now, Focus unfortunately didn't chart on the Billboard Hot 100, but at least it did manage to chart on the Billboard Hot R&B and Hip Hop charts at number 43. I mean, I don't know how much comfort there is to get from that. It's kind of like failing to qualify for the Olympics, jumping off a bridge, and then qualifying for the Special Olympics. Except, of course, qualifying for the Special Olympics is a much more respectable accolade than getting a Billboard R&B hip hop chart hit. But none of that mattered because it was the follow up to Focus, which was Joe Budden's iconic banger. Pump, pump, pump it up. Oh, I'm lit just thinking about it. Pump it up was the ultimate party song. Because of course, who can't relate to that feeling of getting pumped pre-gaming on the way out to a party, getting pumped up to do something in your personal life, or simply pumping up a lie low ready to go for a nice relaxing float in the pool. Or if Royce the Five Nine is to be believed. Apparently Pump It Up is the ultimate tribute to jerking your little ding dong, with the jump off from the song apparently just referring to Joe's hand. Go listen to that track now, you'll know what I mean. But with its infectious hook lifted from Dougie Fresh's track, which Joe Bonham was apparently inspired by after spotting that clip where a DJ spins a cut of it in the film Juice, as well as borrowing the booming horn sample from Cool and the Gang's Soul Vibrations, the song had all the elements of an instantly recognisable party anthem. And so with this track, Joe Budden pumped his way all the way to the sticky heights of the top of the music industry. And of course it didn't take long for Pump It Up to get a slick music video that would go on to dominate the screens of MTV. Now the video itself is actually a parody of the horror movie The Ring, where we see people watching a haunted video but instead of a creepy goth looking chick you get a balding hype man, which in many ways is much more scary. It's basically a remake of The Ring, but instead of some preteen ghoul coming through and breaking your jaw open, you just end up getting bored to death by Toe Budden's lame bars. The premise of the video is essentially if you watch that haunted tape, Joe Budden will appear in your 
your house. Don't worry girls, he's not gonna kill you, he's only gonna choke you a little. To be honest, in many ways, Pump It Up just reminds me that 2003 was probably the creepiest year in music. We had Lil' Kim shaking her magic stick, R. Kelly was sticking his key in people's ignitions, and meanwhile Joe's telling me to pump one up while he's sliding his hand through my ring. I'm just thankful that in 2020 hip hop has calmed down and is more about innocent topics like giving your cat a bar. Anywho, all of my petty mudslinging aside, Pump It Up was a certified hit. Off the back of it, Joe Budden got nominated for the best male solo performance at the Grammys that year, naturally losing out to Eminem's Lose Yourself, this also being the same year that 50 Cent's In The Club was nominated. That's a tough lineup. But he was still nominated, and in addition to that, Pump It Up went number 38 on the Billboard Hot 100. Yes, that is the actual Billboard Chart Hot 100. Well done, Joe. But hell, even sitting at number 38, some might not be impressed by that, but this song was absolutely everywhere. It felt like it was a number one because Pump It Up went all around the world. It ended up on the Too Fast, Too Furious soundtrack, which was amazing, by the way. All right, all right, all right, let him up! Remember that? It was on the Madden 2004 soundtrack. Hell, even in 2003, when I was 10 years old in Bognor Regis, only just learning to pump it for the very first time, making my own CDR burned mixtapes to get me hyped during a particularly difficult Pokemon trading card game Battle. I've got to say Joe Budden's Pump It Up was the essential song for slapping down damage counters on my pokey ops. Hell, if a 10 year old Pokemon geek in England knows your song in 2003, I think it's safe to say that Joe Budden probably secured that big international bag. And while I don't have a DJ clue how much money Joe Budden made off that track, this song was such a hit that even to this day, Joe Budden claims to make at least $18,000 a year just in royalties from that track. I mean, imagine getting a huge bag like that for something that you made 17 years ago. The only other investment decision I can think of that's paid off that well after 17 years was Lil Tecca's mum not getting that abortion. So anyway, around a month after Pump It Up drops, with all of that buzz, Def Jam and Joe decide to drop Joe Budden's debut album. The very creatively titled Joe Budden by Joe Budden. I mean, if I was him, I'd have named every track on the album Joe Budden too. Joe's out here naming his album like Matt Damon in Team America. But anyway, Joe Budden's Joe Budden ended up landing at number eight on the Billboard albums chart, selling 95K first week, going on to sell over 420K records, and eventually going gold. So in a golden position with a hit song, a hit album, and a whole lot of energy, Joe Budden set out to do what every single rapper with a hot song creeping up the charts does. Starts looking for a hotter rapper to jump on the remix to make the song even hotter. But unfortunately for Joe, that didn't quite go to plan. Now, Joe has actually explained the sequence of events that took place when he was looking for a remix to Pump It Up many times over the years. But put simply, Joe Budden felt Pump It Up was the hottest record in the streets. So naturally, this meant that he would need the hottest remix ever, and in order to get that, he would need the hottest rapper in the game. And unfortunately, I was only 10 years old and unavailable at the time. I had a big Pokemon battle that week. So Joe was looking far and wide for the best lyricist he could possibly get on the track. And so he set his sights on the blueprint making, brother shooting, billion dollar stacking, rap game mastermind that is, of course, Jay-Z. Let's holler Jay-Z for the remix. That'll be fucking phenomenal. You know, Jay-Z is my favorite rapper in the world. We're on the same label. It just makes sense. So after reaching out through the powers that be, word got to Jay that Joe was trying to meet him and Jay ended up inviting Joe to a studio session. So Joe Budden went to meet Jay-Z and made a humble appeal to him to try and get him to appear on the Pump It Up remix. And Jay-Z said, he'll think about it. Let him know, listen man, I'm a huge fan. You're like my fucking guy. Love for you to do the remix. Better to chop it up a little bit. And we left. And he said, all right, I'm gonna let you know. Now as far as far as Joe was concerned, he'd made a pretty good impression on Jay. They were on the same label, and of course Joe had a hot song that he thought would have been worth it for Jay-Z to get onto. But as we all know, Jay-Z would step over his own brother for a dollar, or you know, shoot him for a gold ring. So Jay-Z came back to Joe Budden, offering a verse for the remix, but attaching an enormous price tag to it that was so big there would have been no way that Joe could have afforded the verse. Jay-Z told Skane that he was going to charge me to do this remix was a number that he knew good and goddamn well a brand new artist could not afford. And from Joe's perspective, he felt that at this point Jay-Z wasn't just talking business, but was actually setting a fuck you price to try and send a message to Joe. It was basically a no, but it was like a fuck out of here type of no. Now, if you're well acquainted with Joe Budden or all of his modern day media appearances, then you'll know that he can be a bit of an abrasive character, often in his feelings and very quick to take offense. And so he may or may not have been justified in how he interpreted this move from Jay-Z. Hell, who knows, maybe Joe Budden had made a really bad impression on Jay in that studio session anyway. But regardless, Joe Budden's response was adversarial, essentially saying, no way, I am not going to pay you this ridiculous price for a remix. And essentially saying, nah, you can't record on my beat. Jay-Z can't do the remix, I'm not doing the remix. Give me my beat, and I don't want you rapping on my beat. <laughs> 
like a little kid I was. And well, if you're well acquainted with Jay-Z from his many media appearances, or just the many adversarial chess moves that he's made throughout his career, then you'll know that he can also be an abrasive character. And if there's one thing Jay-Z doesn't like, it's not getting what he wants. And so, two weeks after this all went down, Jay-Z out of nowhere releases his very own remix to pump it up without Joe Budden's permission, and the track is filled with lines that are pretty clearly subliminal disses aimed at Joe Budden. Opening the song with the line, Gimme that beat, fool, it's a full-time jack move. He seems to refer to Joe Budden as Harold Miner, a reference to the Miami Heat basketball player who was once tipped to be the next Michael Jordan, but was not, and various other bragging lines about how Jay-Z is the hottest artist in the game, and how Joe ain't. But in Jay's defense, he never mentions Joe Budden by name, and he does say on the song, I ain't talking to nobody in particular. However, it is Joe Budden's beat. I mean, Jay, we're not, we're not fucking stupid, are we? So why on earth would Jay-Z pull such a weird and kind of savage chess move on Joe Budden? Well, part of Jay-Z's displeasure with Joe Budden's success on the song Pump It Up probably has something to do with the fact that Jay-Z and his team had previously passed on the Pump It Up beat. And this kind of makes a lot of sense when you look at the lyrics that Jay-Z raps on his remix, making lots of references to mic devices. Because story goes, this beat was actually meant to be Rock the Mic Part 2. The sequel to Beanie Siegel and Freeway's 2002 hit Rock the Mic, a track released on Jay-Z's Rockefeller Records. So maybe Jay-Z's interest in getting on this track might have not had anything to do with Joe Budden, but his own frustration of missing out on a hit that should have been his. I mean, Rock the Mic Part 1 ended up hitting 55 on Billboard. Joe Budden's Pump It Up, which was apparently supposed to have been Rock the Mic Part 2, ends up going number 38 on Billboard. In fact, in a 2010 interview with the producer of both beats, Rock the Mic Part 1 and Pump It Up, Just Blaze, sorry, I mean, Just Blaze, he revealed that all three rock artists, Beanie Siegel, Freeway, and Jay-Z, had passed on that beat already. Beanie Siegel and Freeway passed on Pump It Up. With Joe, the Joe Budden one. Yeah. Right. Jay also passed on Pump It Up. Yeah, and then went back and redid it. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, we later even found out that Just Blaze had made this beat specifically for the Rockefeller crew, but they didn't want it. I had, I personally made this beat for, um, to be the single after, uh, Rock the Mic. It was supposed to be Jay, Freeway, and Beans, and they didn't want it. In fact, Joe Budden even later admitted that he may have been courting this beef in a small way by specifically taking this hot beat when he knew that it had originally been rejected by Jay-Z and his boys. I said, Sam, burn that beat <laughs> If you don't put that fucking dope ass beat on a CD, give me that beat, man. Fam, you didn't want the beat before, now you want the beat. Whilst initially Joe Budden was livid at Jay-Z's blatant showboating, rejecting the remix, stealing the beat, and then dissing Joe on his own song, Joe later called this an amazing moment in hip hop, saying he kind of liked the feeling of having the best rapper on his ass. I'm sure Beyonce feels the same some nights. And from here, Joe Budden even crafted a response to Jay-Z, tagging his own response onto Jay-Z's remix as another verse, creating a glorious back and forth between Joe and Jay on the Pump It Up beat, this representing that beautiful moment where Joe took his beat back. Guess that was a part-time Jack move, Jay, with Joe dropping a verse where he essentially makes similar lines that Jay-Z made towards him, saying that he's on Jay's level and that he plans to surpass him. Going on to make numerous comparisons between him and Jay-Z, which is kind of fly, but in many ways it sort of invalidates doing a diss track back to him because you're sort of validating that his diss track was good to begin with and yeah, whatever. It was good. It was good. And at the end of the day, Joe Budden kind of ended up getting a Jay-Z verse on his remix completely free. Well, you know, at the cost of dignity. And admittedly, it was a remix that he kind of couldn't really put out anyway. But anyway, the Pump It Up beef was over from there, and unfortunately for Joe, the same business mind that checkmated him into getting dissed on his own hit beat would soon be in the corner office of Def Jam deciding the fate of Joe's career. But first, a thanks to the Patreons. Hey guys, I want to talk to you about something special. Every month I choose a story selected by my supporters on Patreon. This is one of those stories and every month I make a custom song thanking every one of those patrons individually and this is one of those songs. I appreciate all of your support, and if you want to show some support and pick the next story, head on over to patreon.com slash traplawross. Now let's get it. Wow, shout out to Shazza from the south, Abraham Perez and Van Johnson in the house. Basically a bush, you are basically a god. Shout out Bobby Meyer, sorry that I missed you off last week, man. I'm geeked up with Jaden Cho, Duquan Jones and Matt Marsh. Yes, I know. Bumping Matthew Kendrick with Chase Hendrick. Johnny Toxic in the crew, chilling with Wilson Psychedelic. I'm with Sim Hutchins whipping in the Mac kitchen. Shout out to 100 and Eric Fredrickson. 
I burn Pokemon for fun, chill with Vivi the Kicks in the hot tub 2000 and Matt Tate is the kid, Claire Audion, we be balling again with Dylan Gordon and Glenn K, that's my friend with Juan Zuzada, I'm a ride to the end and bring Ryder for the ride with Henry Bryan I'm a twisted guy just like Curly Q and G3 and James C When I'm swerving in the coupe Tammy Whittington and Sean Anderson The crew, Von Snoogle, Renard Hood And of course, Shua 42 Penis bag, McPenis face too I said it again Narad Shukla and Lord Bayel My kind of men Tyler Johnson and Jason Wyman Were straight sliding Hit up chosen one for fun When your boy is unwinding 303 Greedo 5021 And shout out Frank Seds and Damian Edrington Eddie Aguilar Prince Nice Amoir, J Superior, George Roger, and Griffin Fuller, Dawson Slick Pullers, like Javier Gonzalez, Jessica Simon, Aubrey Lopen, Heavia Galvez, the ops are getting meaner, unlike Harry Virginia and Mark Vader, yeah, I see ya, we put ops in the ER, Devin Metz, you're the best, no stress, and Josh G grows mids if you're smoking on the cess, Jim Sterling's Randy Pitchford, 10 stars in Pitchfork, Norman Quinn just got rich, so we finna buy a big Porsche, kind of emo, kind of white girl, that's what I like, I don't pay for pussy, I just order vampires for hire, shout out Steno, Steno, Sipping Lemoncello, I got mellow with Otaku VS and Ryan Espo. Big thanks to Twisted Future, I know you're a shooter, and all my other patrons, cause you lot are super. Shout out Alien Evasion for the beat, and go to patreon.com slash Traplor Ross if you want to support me. Ah, oh, I lost it at the end, but it's all love. Thank you so much to the supporters, hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you go and vote for next month's story, and definitely go and support me if you want to show some love, it would mean the world to me. Thank you. Now we all know that Jay-Z ended 2003 with a bang. No, I'm not talking about another affair. I'm talking about when he dropped the Black Album and planned to metaphorically fade to black and retire from the rap game. Apparently with the plan to become a corporate record exec, i.e. the head honcho over at Def Jam. Because by 2004, Jay-Z had parted ways with his longtime business partner and one of the most iconic big old baldy heads in hip hop, Dame Dash. I actually made a whole video about the Dame Dash, Jay-Z, Rockefeller fallout. That's worth a watch. Go check it if you haven't seen it. But in the course of ditching Rockefeller records, Jay-Z became the president of Def Jam. Hang on a minute, Def Jam's Joe Budden's label. Fuck. And while there was never any big public reveal of Jay-Z meddling or sabotaging Joe Budden's career over at Def Jam, his relationship with Def Jam began to disintegrate quicker than a 6ix9ine novelty face mask. And so in the years that followed, while still on the Def Jam label, in spite of the hostile atmosphere over there, Joe Budden continued to drop music. His follow-up to Pump It Up was the track Fire, Yes Yes Y'all, featuring Busta Rhymes, which actually did similarly to Focus, i.e. Bad, landing in at number 48 on the Billboard Crap Chart. Sorry, I mean Rap Chart. Once again, failing to land on the Billboard Hot 100, real chart. But to be fair, it did hit 128 on the UK singles chart, likely the direct result of me spinning that song over and over again during yet another particularly difficult Pokemon trading card game tournament. But to Joe Budden's credit, he did have momentary success with a feature on the R. Kelly produced track, Clubbin, by budget ludicrous Marquise Houston. Hey, it's good to know that Joe Budden knows as much about making hit songs as he does about wearing jerseys properly. Now that track, Clubbin, actually did hit number 39 on the real Billboard charts and it even went 15 in the UK. Because you know how much R. Kelly loves hitting 15. But like most things produced by R. Kelly, it might have made quite a stink upon release, but it would eventually slide on down the gutter and be swept under the rug as if it never happened. But thankfully for all the real hip hop heads, Joe Budden would continue to feed the streets with bars, even whilst being muzzled from the mainstream by Def Jam. Joe went on to release two issues of his now infamous Mood Music mixtape series, which didn't do huge numbers at the time, but were critically acclaimed. And hell, it might have taken 15 years for them to admit it, but Complex eventually did put Joe Budden's Mood Music down as one of its greatest hip hop mixtapes of all time. Now that's what I call a project that ages well. So Joey's pen game was never up for discussion, but his mainstream appeal and his ability to fit into the box that labels wanted him to fit into was up for debate. And hey, it's highly possible that Jay-Z's bitter behind the boardroom doors feud with Joe Budden might have had something to do with this. After all, by 2005, the facade on Jay-Z's fake retirement had completely fallen. And in another slippery move, he had announced that he was making a comeback to the rap game with his new album, Kingdom Come. And hey, when your label boss is is literally you, the chances are you're probably going to get the lion's share of resources and promotion. I mean, consider that in combination with the fact that Jay-Z obviously thinks that he's a great lyricist, and when Joe Budden is out there dropping these underground mixtapes that are filled with fire bars and high-level penmanship, chances are Jay-Z might have seen this as a threat. So in spite of Joe
Joe Budden feed in the street with hard bars in mixtape form, the label that Joe Budden's rival Jay-Z was running naturally weren't supporting any of it. To his credit, Joe had continued to work on his sophomore album titled The Growth. Terrible title, by the way. I've got a bit of a Joe Budden sophomore album coming in on the underside of my balls, if I'm honest. But to be fair to him, Joe Budden kept trying. He dropped the track Gangster Party with Nate Dogg in May of 2005. It was meant to be the first single off of The Growth. And whilst the song itself was an excellent Scott Storch produced banger, naturally the stuffed shirts over at Def Jam claimed that they were looking for another pump it up. And Gangster Party just wasn't that. The track landed at number 94 on the hip hop charts again, but didn't manage to get on the Hot 100. And sadly for Joey, this will be his last chance. Because in October of 2007, hip hop blogs began to report that Joe Budden and Def Jam Records had parted ways. And according to Joe in this vintage DJ Vlad interview that is well worth watching, apparently Joe Budden found out that he had been canned from Def Jam the same way everybody else did. He woke up and read it on a blog. I woke up and read on the internet that I would drop from Def Jam. <laughs> That's pretty simple. And my heart started beating fast, like. Joe actually claimed to be happy to be off the label after the way that he'd been treated. Saying simply, they just weren't letting him release any music. Uh, I was on Def Jam, I put one album out and they wouldn't put any more of my music out. Thankfully, Joe Budden was able to rebuild his career after the Def Jam debacle. I mean, performance wise, he would never reach the heights of Pump It Up again in his career. But most likely, that is exactly what he wanted, because Joe was a lyricist. And Def Jam were just looking for hits like Pump It Up. And chances are, they didn't care who they were getting them from. Joe's not a party rapper, and he was never gonna fit into the box that Def Jam wanted to put him in. And if you know Joe Budden, like I know Joe Budden, he is the last person that is going to conform to what your idea of an artist is going to be. And you've got to give Joe Budden credit for staying true to himself and who he is throughout his career, no matter what anyone thinks. In fact, throughout his entire career, Joe has continued to be outspoken. And it's that same attitude that has dragged him into high profile beef with the likes of Saigon or even Drake, as well as giving him his career as a commentator, because it is that attitude that people want to see when the genre of music they love is being discussed. And today, the reason everybody loves Joe Budden and his podcast and all of the other things that he appears on is because he's got that same I don't give a fuck attitude that he used to have on the mic, regardless of whether he's using that mic to rap or commentate. That's why we love Joe Budden. That's why we hate Joe Budden. And that's probably why Joe Budden got fired from Complex. Thanks for watching. Peace out.